um, this timber from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Um, and I think we'll obviously be having an interesting uh, discussion that uh, follows uh, probably from uh, the discussion that we last we just had in the previous um, um, session, um, uh, which is titled uh, Strengthening and, and Building Regional uh, Value Chains. Um, we having three presentations, or should I say exciting presentations, and I hope everyone is, um, is, is ready. Um, uh, the first presentation by Gillian, who is an economist at uh, TIPS. Um, the second one by um, Tabanga Moyo, who is a sector analyst in the Department um, of uh, Economic Development and Tourism in the Northern Cape. Um, and the last one being from Elvis, um, hopefully he has joined, um, a researcher at the Technology and the Management Center for Development at the University of, uh, of Oxford. Um, uh, colleagues, you are all given uh, 20 minutes uh, for the presentation, which will be expected to focus on the um, key issues uh, which will be of interest to allow us to structure our conversations and uh, also given that the presentations will be uh, shared um, afterwards. Um, so Gillian, if you're ready, um, can we start? Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, Baba, can you hear me? Go ahead, Joel, I can hear you. Thank you. Um, so good morning, colleagues. The presentation today will be on agro-processing machinery in the SADC region. Um, and we will be looking at grain milling machinery in Zambia um, and South Africa. Now, as we heard the other speakers speak before, they spoke about industrialization within the African region. And so we're kind of focusing on SADC um, for today in this one and kind of trying to look at regional um, localization. Now, the strategy and roadmap was launched about five years ago and its background focus was on industrialization. And we can see that agro-processing has been identified as one of the growth paths for industrialization, largely because we're wanting to transform from its deep structure fault lines that remain entrenched by resource dependence, low value addition, and low levels of exports of knowledge intensive products. And these were some of the things that were noted in the past presentations, even yesterday as well. And so a fundamental message today is, is agro-processing stimulating regional manufacturing capabilities in its machinery, equipment, and parts? So we're looking at um, machinery in agro-processing today. Now the theoretical underpinnings for this is largely manufacturing-led industrialization. And we can see that agro-processing fits well with this conceptualization. For starters, it stimulates growth for agricultural products and farming, while its output is input for the food industry and the retail sector. Secondly, it stimulates demand for the manufacturing of machinery, equipment and parts, and the aftermarket as well as in services. And thirdly, it stimulates demand for metal products, services in fabrication and working of steel and engineering services. And um, our last underpinning as well is ISI, which advocates for reducing input linkages and promoting manufacturing capabilities or regional localization. Um, a regional, the methodology that we used here was a regional approach and for agro-processing machinery, an integrated regional value chain would be one in which the majority of agricultural machinery, equipment and parts used are manufactured within the region. Now the challenges and limitations for this research is that it is very, very fragmented to non-existent, but this paper aimed to contribute to filling in gaps within the body of knowledge and to encourage future research in the region around machinery used in the major agro-processing value chains. Now, if we look at this graph here, there are two things we want to come out of it. The first one is we can see that manufacturing, the share of manufacturing to to GDP has been declining. And so what this research is advocating for is, could we up this by looking at um, manufacturing our own machinery in major value chains? And the second thing we want to ask is, what makes up the SADC manufacturing sector? 
Now, it is difficult to get information up that's updated on the subsectors within manufacturing for the whole of SADC. So what I did was look at each country individually, and we can see that of, of the 15 countries in SADC, about seven of them have agro-processing in the form of um, food and beverages as the top three manufacturing subsectors. And so today we're looking at South Africa, which, which top subsector is within food and beverages, and Zambia as well. So therefore, since the roadmap advocates for a vibrant agro-processing industry to capture the full possible value, this paper advocates that the roadmap also focus on the nature of the supply of machinery used for agro-processing. So now if we look at the SADC region and demand for machinery, we can see a hectic, horrible um, negative trade balance here between imports and exports, although there have been a bit of exports, but these are largely from South Africa. We have, you can see we have a negative trade balance. Uh, however, this suggests that there is growth in demand for machinery, which suggests possibilities for import substitution industrialization, which also suggests possibilities for building manufacturing capabilities in machinery. Now, these are just some of the machineries which are important by the SADC region. And for example, sugar machinery, brewery machinery, um, parts for the grain milling industry, milking machinery, and all sorts of machinery. And today we're largely just focusing on food processing. Now, because this was a short paper to kind of distill what type of machinery to look at, I looked at the major consumption patterns within the SADC region. And we can see that grains make up uh, most of the consumption patterns particularly maize, corn, wheat, sorghum, and rice. And we can see that the strength of maize consumption suggests a positive outlook for related agro-processing of grains, and therefore growing demand for agro-processing machinery. Now, when we look at just grain milling machinery, we can see that we also have a negative um, trade balance. We can see the region is a net importer of grain milling machinery. Um, and this growth has been largely due to increase in demand in grain products as a staple um, and as well as for stock fee. And we can also see that um, the government and private sector initiative have contributed to growth in new processing firms and this has seen machinery growing of imports. And our top importers are South Africa, Zambia and Malawi, Angola, Namibia, Mozambique and Tanzania. And unfortunately, we, also, we just have one or two exporters and the main one is South Africa. Now, going on to our case studies to kind of go in depth into this research, um, I looked at Zambia and to our right here, we can see that the food and beverage industry has been growing. And our question, as I noted before, is what's happening at the back part of it with machinery. And um, so Zambia, as its national industrial policy, put out eight priority subsectors um, as its focus. And one of these is agro-processing machinery and engineering products. And we want to see what's happening there. Now, if we look at Zambia's um, imports and exports of agro-processing machinery, there's barely any exports. All of it is all imports. Um, and particularly the import of milling of grains, as I noted before, looking at the consumption patterns of SADC. And we have seen this imports have grown from about 25 million to 155 million in 2017. And so, you know, with these imports of agro-processing machinery represent a leakage. And, and so with growth in imports, meaning there is demand, meaning there are po probably possibilities for manufacturing our own machinery in SADC. If we look at grain milling in Zambia, we can see that um, the number of firms have grown from 35 to 78. And so if we just look at the growth in number of firms, we know that they will need to repair, they will need engineering services, and they will need to increase their capacity. And so what is happening to that regard? Now, when we spoke to interviews in Zambia of the grain millers, they noted that Zambia uses a combination of mechanical and semi-automated machinery. Now, growth in sales of processed products has led to purchasing of bigger and more advanced milling plants, and therefore they've been importing this machinery. Much of this machinery has been coming from the European Union, has been coming from the US and South Africa. 
Um, and I think sadly, it is estimated that only about 10% of the spare parts are sourced within locally or within the SADC region, and the remainder are deep sea imports. They noted that a major constraint faced by milling firms is the unavailability of locally produced advanced machinery and parts, which forces them to import. And so when they import, they also face a lag time of about four to five months, and this disrupts production. But most importantly, what grain millers in Zambia noted was that there's a willingness to procure, if machinery is available in the region, of a sufficient quality, if it's durable, and if deliverable times are shorter with equipment servicing and support being available. Now, when we spoke to the suppliers of grain milling machinery, they noted that um, there were just very few manufacturers of advanced machinery most firms mainly import parts from India and China, which they assemble for the market. They noted that there's an unavailability of support in research and development, innovation and technology to make better products that meet the technological frontier required by the grain miners. They also noted high cost in labor, but they also noted that the region is seen as a potential area to supply to. Now, moving on to our case, second case study, South Africa, we can also see that food and beverages um, is the largest subsector within the manufacturing sector, and that the South African government has identified agro-processing as a critical driver for inclusive growth. Now, growth in agro-processing means growth in demand for machinery, equipment, and parts, as I noted before, even for Zambia and the rest of the SADC region. If we look at imports and exports of agro-processing machinery, we can see that there's also, even in South Africa, it's a net, it's a net importer of machinery. And um, this has risen from 2001 from just 48 million to 252 million in 2018. And um, although we can see there's a very good part, we can see some exports have been growing then. This is what we're trying to encourage within the region. And so some of the major, major machinery that's been important is milling machinery for grain and parts. Now, the nature of grain milling in South Africa is such that um, in 1998, we had about 100 firms in grain milling, and these have grown to about 300 in 2018. Now, the growth in milling firms has been attributed again for demand um, in the staple foods, and, and largely because of investment in green and brownfield projects by the South African government. And again, as I noted before, this growth in number of firms is capable of stimulating growth in the manufacture of machinery or parts. Now, when we spoke to South African grain millers, we got the view that South African firms are large and better equipped compared to other firms within the region, and most of the larger firms are automated. However, small and emerging firms, mainly in rural or peri-urban area, use mechanical machinery. They noted as grain millers that it's very difficult in accessing the right type of machinery um, locally, particularly the automated machinery. And so most, most of them import, um, they procure mainly from the European manufacturers, such as Germany and Switzerland, Australia, China, Japan, and the US. And they noted for imported machinery, a major constraint is whether or not the supplier is able to offer the necessary backup during breakdowns and provide spare parts in, and maintenance timely. And they also noted similar to Zambia, the lag time of getting imported machinery from deep sea and the cost of freight and insurance, which adds to overall running costs. Um, it was also noted that smaller firms in rural areas find it difficult to obtain parts since they're far from urban centers to import. However, I think what was very big was that there is a willingness to procure locally within South Africa and the region if the price and the quality is right. Now, speaking to suppliers of grain milling machinery within um, South Africa, there is no association that specifically collects information in respect to agro-processing machinery. Um, they, noticed, they also noted that um, established firms have agreements or partnerships with international firms to import, assemble, and then distribute and sell the equipment. And uh, most of these agreements are between South Africa, mainly the European firms, Russia, India, and the US. They noted that the potential clients are with definitely within local and within the region, 
However, the problem was they do not, um, the region does not have funds to purchase machines because of the importing of parts makes the whole overall machinery expensive. They also noted issues of high electricity, water, and rising wages. So what are our conclusions and possibilities? We know that the growing populations, which means a demand for food, such as our staples for maize, wheat, or rice, which means growth in agro-processing of grain. And what does this mean for us? It means that there is demand for machinery, equipment, and parts. Um, and as we spoke before in the start, we wanted to look at what was happening here. But we can see that despite growth in agro-processing, this is not translating into building manufacturing capabilities of machinery within SADC, as illustrated by the high levels of imports, which are ex actually expected to grow. And now if we look with COVID-19, we have delays in deep sea imports, a halt in deep sea manufacturing, limited movement for engineers to repair, and we can see that this can halt production. And so this should also be kind of a push towards regional localization of building our own machinery. And so this leads us to say we need pulled efforts to translate input leakages into building machinery capabilities. Now, our possible recommendations is that there is definitely need for more intensive research on agro-processing machinery and that SADC states need to increasingly invest in innovation and technology capabilities to enable them to upgrade, expand their manufacturing base. Now, on the supply side, there's definitely a need for R&D in any industry, which is very essential for achieving productivity and efficiency. Now, for the SADC region, the main aim of R&D should be to make a machinery of a sufficient quality, durability, machinery that is efficient, affordable, and meets the technological frontiers required by the milling firms. And again, similar to capital equipment, developing of centers of excellence for machinery. And on the demand side, um, assistance to associations and businesses and firms in linking many firms with local and regional manufacturers. So in Zambia, um, some of the, the association noted that they didn't have a stockist or a list of what's uh, manufacturing machinery. And it was the same when we spoke to many firms in South Africa. And so we need concerted efforts by government to address information asymmetries um, and this is seen as fundamental. So thank you very much. And over it, I'd just like to say again, the whole point of this presentation was just to look at what's happening agro-processing machinery within the SADC region. As we can see, we have a lot of imports and we're kind of trying to look at import substitution industrialization and localization and trying for the SADC region to increase its manufacturing base by looking at all its equipment that's used in the major processing value chains. Um, I thank you very much. And uh, on the Northern Cape uh, dried uh, grape industry, uh, the uh, agenda is to find if there are opportunities for market growth uh, internationally. Okay, uh, this is how the presentation is structured. Okay, uh, as a way of background, uh, sorry. as a way of background, I started asking the question, why dried grapes in the Northern Cape? Uh, dried grapes is one of the key export commodities in the national aquaposing sector. 90% of the output uh, is uh, exported in uh, South Africa as a net exporter. Uh, it, uh, the, the industry also generate quite a lot in terms of uh, for, forex earnings, 100 million annually uh, as per 2016, and also for the first quarter of 2018 alone, 26 uh, million uh, US dollars was generated. SA is ranked in the top five globally in terms of both production and exports, and is the only global producer in the continent and the second largest in the Southern Hemisphere. Dried grapes have been identified in the NTP as one of the commodities with high employment potential and greater opportunities for market growth. And uh, recently, in the economic policy paper that was generated by Treasury, it has also been identified you know, as one of the key uh, uh, sectors that can 
could generate uh, forex uh, for the country. The Northern Cape is the capital of the dry grape industry in South Africa. More than 90% of the national output comes from the Northern Cape. And this is because of the natural endowment uh, that is in the Northern Cape in terms of uh, the weather, the ecological condition, the climate, and also there is the Orange River, which is the source of water, you know, that is facilitated by the irrigation infrastructure that is there in the province. In addition, efforts are underway in the Northern Cape to develop new vineyards and uh, increase production, hence the need for new markets. The research method that we followed to do the study, it's uh, a combination of three things. We did secondary data analysis, you know, uh, many statistics from the International Trade Center, Trade Map Database. We did document analysis of the key documents generated by the key role players regionally, locally, and also globally. And lastly, we also had uh, key information, informants interviews, you know, we interviewed uh, the processing factories around the province. And the key question that we asked is, can the Northern Cape dry grape industry expand its global market? And if so, which countries constitute the target market? This is how the international dry grape market looks. Okay. Uh, there are mainly five you know, major producing nations, you know, uh, in 2018, more than 1.7 million tons were produced, and the top 10 countries, you know, account for more than 90% of that production. You can see that uh, in the U.S., which is one of the major producing nations, you know, uh, production is declining because there is change in the land use. There, uh, farmers are converting vineyards into orchards, and also Iran there is also declining production, including Chile. This opens up opportunities for the South African industry, you know, to fill up the gap that is created by those big producers. In terms of exports, the exports picture uh, mirrors uh, the production picture. The US, Turkey uh, are the two biggest uh, exporters and also the two biggest producers. But the US, as you have seen previously, is declining in terms of exports for the reasons, for the reasons mentioned earlier. This is the market for the dried grapes, you know, globally. Uh, the top 10 importing countries account for 60% of the imports. Uh, and, and the EU alone, the aggregate imports uh, by the EU is more than 50%, you know, of all the imports, which means that the EU is an important uh, market. Uh, the other point that I would like to mention is that uh, among the top 10 uh, producers, You've got uh, uh, the US uh, and India and China that also have big national markets, you know, uh, for the dried crepes. And that has implications for market access for South Africa. It's not relatively easy to enter into a market where there are already local uh, producers in that market. I'll expand on that point uh, later. Uh, I also want us to look at uh, the South African uh, situation, you know, the production, exports, and markets in South Africa for the for for for, for dried grapes. Okay, uh, in South Africa, uh, you've got about uh, a thousand farmers, uh, mostly located in the Northern Cape along the Orange River, uh, that produce most of the uh, of the of the product. And that is supplemented by producers in the Western Cape, uh, along the Olifants River, and also Namibia. Uh, but uh, there are efforts that are being undertaken. You know, uh, the Lower Orange River Dried Fruit Initiative, which is an initiative uh, by the industry itself, the IDC, and the other government uh, stakeholders to actually boost uh, production to increase the uh, area under cultivation. In terms of processors, there are seven processors, the biggest being uh, Pioneer Foods that took over the South African Dried Food Cooper Cooperative, you know, 
And then after that, you've got uh, the raising company. That was the first uh, uh, processing factory to be established after the deregulation of the agricultural sector. You know, that uh, dismantled the monopoly position that SAD had had for a long time. And then uh, we had more other processors coming in uh, following the establishment of the raising company to the extent that now we've got seven processors in total and all are located in the uh, Orange River region. And that's why we say that the, the Northern Cape is actually the capital of the dried grape industry uh, because of uh, the processing and also the growing of the dried grapes. This is how the, the distribution of uh, production looks like. And uh, what I'll perhaps emphasize is that uh, growth is expected to reach uh, 125,000 tons in 2030. You know, and that additional uh, output will need a market internationally. The, the, the dry grapes are an export commodity. And uh, it will also need uh, an extra uh, processing capacity as the current capacity can only you know, process up to around uh, 100,000 tons. This is the market composition for SA dry grapes. You know, it's mostly Europe, uh, North America, and uh, a few African countries. And uh, you can see that uh, the market is mostly growing. Uh, there's growth in individual countries in terms of the exports that are, are going there. Okay, before we looked at uh, the com competition in the uh, uh, international market or in the export market, we sort of looked at uh, the level of protection, you know, uh, that exists uh, in the different markets uh, against the exports from South Africa of dried grapes, you know, and you'll notice that uh, <clears throat> in most of Africa, you know, there is uh, tariff protection for dried grapes coming from South Africa. Uh, in the US, it's open uh, due to uh, AGOA. Also in Europe, uh, there are trade agreements that South Africa has with the European Union that allows free entry of the product there. Turkey and India are closed because they've got their own uh, industry there and they need to protect it, you know. Uh, that applies also to uh, Kazakhstan, which is also a global producer. So the tariffs are relatively high in those markets. But in some of the major markets, particularly in, within the European Union in North America, South Africa have got uh, access, uh, uh, tariff, tariff free access, including mainly the Sardic region. Uh, but if you look at West Africa, you know, the market is relatively close there in some parts of East Africa. Okay, to analyze the competition, we disintegrated the global market into three components, the traditional market, uh, the small growing market, and also the African market. The African market is very important, you know, for South Africa uh, because of its proximity and uh, the geopolitical advantages that Africa could have over the competing nations. Starting with the traditional market, uh, the traditional market is mainly the top 20 importing countries, you know, mostly in the European Union that account for more than 75% of global imports. And it includes the USA, China, India, which are also major producer nations with big national markets, you know, implying that. Uh, market access in those markets uh, could prove to be a challenge because those countries will need to protect their own industries. There are about 10 countries that are competing in South African international market, Turkey, USA, Iran, Chile, Afghanistan, China, Greece, Argentina, and Australia. This is how uh, it looks, you know, in terms of uh, the global shares, the size of the market, you know, uh, the size of the the markets relative to the to the global picture. The UK is the biggest market, followed by Germany. As you have noted earlier, the European Union as an as a region is actually the biggest uh, importer of dry grapes, more than 50% of the imports annually. Okay, this slide just shows uh, the presence of South Africa in the different markets. You know, the red bar actually represents South Africa, 
and it shows uh, the market share that South Africa has in those markets. For instance, in the UK, uh, South Africa is the smallest market share amongst the biggest, the top 10 uh, producing countries. In Germany, it is second after Turkey. In the Netherlands, uh, it is uh, fourth, and in Japan, it's quite, it's quite small. So it indicates how uh, big is the South African market share in the traditional markets. You know, I'll run through the slides, you know. Uh, you can just take note of the red the bar that shows South Africa's uh, presence in those markets. And then the small growing markets, uh, th these are the markets that uh, realize uh, a growth of uh, between 10% to a maximum of more than 1,000% you know, over a five year period in terms of imports going into those places. And then those markets, they also tend to be very tiny importers, you know, individually uh, a minimum of 500 tons to a maximum of 5.6 thousand tons, which is still uh, around about 1% of the global imports. So growth in those markets of a very low base it's about 35 countries out of the 208 countries importing dried grapes annually that fit uh, that criteria. But in aggregate, is they're quite big. They import 270,000 tons annually worth more than 100 uh, uh, million uh, US dollars, which is quite a, a big market. Uh, they're mostly located in Southeastern Europe, Southeast Asia, and South America. In those places, the, the middle class is growing and also the awareness uh, in terms of health, you know, and so demand is driven by those two factors. They're expected to continue growing and the participation of South Africa as a source of imports is limited. Despite that, in some of those markets, the tariffs are, are zero, you know. Uh, but when we referred this uh, point to the industry, they noted that, uh, it is costly to supply small geographically scattered markets. And to them, the solution it could be having regional distribution centers, you know. And also, they also noted the cultural barriers in terms of language uh, in doing business, you know. And uh, they suggested that maybe export agencies could assist uh, to tap into those markets. And then this was five indicated. Minutes. Five minutes. OK, thank you. Okay, I'll run through this slides, just indicate the presence of South Africa in the small growing markets. And then the African market is another interesting market. It's uh, small individually, but very big in aggregate. And uh, South Africa's presence also in the African market is very limited despite geographic proximity and uh, some trade agreements that South Africa has within the continent. So we see an opportunity there in the African market. And then this just indicates uh, South Africa's exports into Africa, you know, and uh, the key issue that most of the importers of dry grapes in Africa are based in the north of the continent. And as you move out away from the north, you know, uh, the, the, exp the imports uh, become smaller and smaller. But what is encouraging is that there is growth in those markets. Right, the proposals for market growth uh, that came from engagement with industry, you know, uh, through a workshop and also the interviews that we had with the processors. And uh, there are three points that I would like to mention. The, the first point is that uh, we need to expand production, you know. Uh, luckily, the industry, together with government and other stakeholders, they're under currently uh, making efforts to expand uh, production, you know, at the primary level. And then uh, the other point that uh, uh, we agreed upon, you know, through our engagement with industries, that uh, we need to retain the markets that we currently export to, which are very key markets: the EU, the US, Canada, and also uh, target new markets, you know, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, some parts of Eastern Europe, and also focus on Africa. Uh, so those are the three uh, areas of interventions that we thought would uh, assist in creating growth uh, internationally. In conclusion, there is scope for market growth for the Northern Cape grape industry, but growth opportunities are to be found not only in the big traditional markets in the EU, North America, and East Asia, but also in the smaller growing markets in Southeastern Europe, Southeast Asia, and Africa. 
trade agreements could be one of the instruments that could be used, you know, to actually uh, uh, create market growth for those territories that have been identified. However, we need to be cognizant of some of the factors that could limit market access internationally. You know, regionalism in some of the key markets that also host major producing nations, you know, geographic proximity of some major producers to the big markets and uh, big country markets that uh, also have huge trade groups industries, e.g. US, China, India, Australia, and Turkey. Thank you. Having me here to share um, a paper I worked on with, with a mentor of mine, um, Professor Fiona Tregana, who is at the University of um, Johannesburg, um, looking at um, that tech effects of uh, tech effects in manufacturing on CO2 emissions. And uh, you would notice here that the title has, we've modified the title a, a bit from what we submitted earlier on. Um, to avoid breaking off, I would like to put off my video, if that's okay. So um, my presentation this morning uh, would focus mainly on, 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 on the discussion of the key issues that um, we discussed in the paper. And uh, I will try to keep some of the not very relevant issues like the literature, the data, and some of the uh, methods we used. Um, I will spend some time on, the, on discussing our results that we find from the empirical estimations and also on the, some of the key um, policy recommendations that um, emerge. I'll be happy to discuss some of these issues uh, into detail uh, in, in, in the discussion if, if need be. So um, I hope you all believe by now that the, the climate um, problem is, is real and, and is, is, is immediate. Uh, in my view, the agency of, this, uh, of the climate issue is quite well highlighted in the various um, international protocols that we've seen um, being enacted across the world. And the latest, is, which, which is the Paris Agreement, sort of highlights some of these um, issues. Um, and I would say that the response, I think the global response to, to, to the climate problem has, has been quite universal across both developed and developing countries. Um, we do on, on, on issues regarding uh, the reduction of, of, of carbon footprint. But we do see how um, diverging some of these global, global um, accords could also be for national uh, development agenda what comes to mind right now is, is the U.S. Um, um, sort of um, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, citing issues that it is unfair to its um, national goals or national policies. So there is quite um, clear evidence that um, the main causes of climate change is it's, um, it's, it's from industrialization. And, and we've seen this coming up from a, a lot of the evidences that uh, we have available. And often the, the image that we see being evolved is that industrialization is, um, industrialization is sort of a smokestack industries where we see a lot of factories releasing um, dust, smoke, and fumes and, 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 and toxic emissions in, in, into the atmosphere. Um, while this, to, to, to a large extent, may, may be true, um, we also do recognize that industrialization is a key part uh, for, 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 for developing countries to, us, at, to sort of attain some of the high growth levels and, and some of the sustainable um, catch up that we see most of the developing countries attain now and we see some of the uh, newly industrialized countries um, enjoy at the moment. And historically, we do see how industrialization or manufacturing in particular serve as a key engine of growth um, uh, in creating jobs and, and livelihoods and, and ultimately sort of improving uh, the social well-being of, of, of some countries. And this is also evident, as, as I've already mentioned, um, in the amazing catch-up we've seen the new industrialized countries attain. And also, quite recently, um, China's path to, to achieving similar development goals to um, industrialization. So, Given these global issues, um, an emerging countries face sort of um, a conundrum, right? Um, where there are dual challenge of industrializing by doing this um, 
sustainably. And these issues often have or often face um, um, tensions. So do we industrialize or do we take care of the, of the climate or how do we try to sort of balance this and, 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 and combine both and achieve the, the, the sort of growth and well-being that we, we all desire, particularly in, in, in the late um, in industrializing uh, countries. So in, in these discussions, a, a critical point often to note is that um, manufacturing is always not all about small stack industry. It's not about um, generating toxic uh, fumes in, into the climate change. Uh, we, 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 there's also an evidence that shows that um, tech, tech intensive uh, industries or manufacturing uh, is cleaner than, than, than heavy industries and these are less um, polluting, for instance. And um, some of the experiences of the newly industrialized countries where they focus mainly on, on, on very tech intensive industries tends to show this, this evidence. And there are also some, some discussions on, on green industrial policy that tries to sort of um, foster um, sustainable industrial development in, 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 in countries. So, so while, while there are sort of um, discussions in developing countries in part and sort of amidst uh, some of these broad policy frameworks, um, targeting mainly uh, investment in, in, in technologies, investment in tech intensive industries. We do see also that there is a very little evidence regarding these industries, for instance, and also how these industries sort of affect um, the, the climate discussion that we, we often tend to um, um, focus on. So I think that the primary objective of, of our paper is to sort of look at some of these issues and see how uh, tech intensity in manufacturing specifically affects CO2 emissions. Um, but also we also tend to sort of uh, contribute, we also have some secondary other contributions where we look generally at what is available in the literature and try to add to this literature as well, in addition to sort of modify and sort of synthesize some of the available methods in the, in the, in the, in the literature. So um, in terms of available works, quite briefly, there are sort of interdisciplinary perspectives. And I would, I'll classify these mainly into, let's say, two, the industrialist views and the, and the ecological views. And these, I must say, are very strong opposing views. Um, so from the perspective of industrialists, we, we, do, we do hear that there is an inverted, let's say, an inverted relationship between um, manufacturing or industrialization and CO2 emissions, meaning, therefore, that um, as can, at, as countries are lower levels of, of, of industrialization, they tend to um, use lower tech, uh, technology. So they tend to pollute more the, the environment. But as they develop, they uh, reduce the, the use of these technologies and use much more cleaner technologies. And therefore, they, they tend to pollute less. So what, what this simply means is that countries can grow now and clean up later, develop at, at later stages of, 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 of development. And this, um, and issues sometimes are, are sort of problematic, given that um, the climate problem is, is not sort of re reversible. So once we pollute the environment now, it's very hard, it's very difficult or, go, or very hard to go back to its of, of original state. So un understandably, there are, of course, critics um, mainly from the ecological views that argue that um, that, that sort of defend the environment against industrialization quite briefly. Um, and these critics sort of go back to the heart of industrialization that argue, and they argue that we should experience degrowth. In other words, we, sh we, sh we should sort of limit industrialization. And, and in, in recent years, we do see some, some balancing arguments coming up um, in, in the, in, with the view that we could industrialize, but we can do this sustainably. And this, comes mainly from the green uh, industrial policy uh, perspective that I've, I've, I've mentioned. And, and with the reality that we do have a dual challenge, particularly for developing countries or emerging countries, that they would also want to grow and develop and attain the, the uh, per capita income and the growth levels that we do see in, in different industrialized countries. But how can we do this um, and sort of whilst we protect the, the, the environment? So there are a lot of discussions on some of this. Um, issues that are coming up.
and uh, th there is quite some extensive empirical literature on some of these issues, mainly on 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 the on on, on the industrialist view, and we do see so quite briefly um, an invented view relationship um, where we do see that higher levels of growth tend to, um, they tend to reduce um, CO2 emissions, and we do also see that the evidence that industrialization, uh, higher levels of industrialization in reducing CO2 emissions. So there is some, some evidence on some of these issues. So what we do is to contribute mainly to some of these issues and also bring out some, 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 some new evidence. Um, so I'll, I'll skip this, but we, we just simply formulate very simple dynamic panel estimation models. And uh, we use, um, sorry, and we use, um, data from from data from w award developing indicators and 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 you need those cip for 56 emerging and developing countries between uh, 1991 and 20 uh, and 2014. so in terms of the data um what, what this shows simply is a depiction of a depiction of um, um the evolution of, of CO2 emissions across uh, some sort of the developing countries that we have in our database. And we do see, in terms of uh, kilotons, we do see China to be by far the largest uh, emitter of CO2 emissions. Um, in South Africa, which is of interest now, it's, it's uh, way below down here, right above um, Brazil. But when, when we consider uh, the CO2 emissions in per capita terms, uh, in metric tons, uh, we do see Russia, you know, uh, jumping up quite, quite uh, um, massively, and we do see South Africa also also coming up, and we see China, you know, a trending very, very, very high, also doing a catching up in terms of CO2 emissions per capita. So, um, in terms of the baseline results, I'll try, I'll try, to, I'll skip the tables of results and go just. The, the summary of, of, of these results. And I think we can, we can discuss to detail the specific detail uh, results if, if need be. So um, in, in, in our estimations, I can tell you that uh, we do see some path, some path uh, dependency of, of previous CO2 emissions um, affecting quite strongly uh, the current levels of emissions, also trying to satisfy or, or agreeing with, 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 with the reality that um, CO2 emissions are quite irreversible and that if we want to sort of resolve the climate or, or, or sort of care the climate problem, we need to do it now rather than tomorrow. Um, other results also collaborate mainly uh, with, with what we see in the literature in terms of the, of the, of the um, environmental the curve and the step up models, which all argue that, which the, the EKC argues that uh, higher levels of growth tend to um, um, lead to lower CO2 emissions. And CO2, uh, the step up model also agreeing that um, higher levels of industrialization tend to um, um, lead to lower emissions. So our result in, 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 in the first instance tends to agree with some of these results. But what we do, what we did in the first part is we used mainly manufacturing share in GDP than what is normally normal what is normally used in the literature, which is um, um, uh, sort of shell shell uh, industrialization or shell industrial output in, in value add. Uh, so to, to our main contributions um, we do see uh, that where, where we disaggregate um, manufacturing into its tech intensity meaning minimum and high tech one uh, value added and low tech value added we do see a very converse negative relationship between uh, medium and high tech manufacturing value added and, and CO2 emissions, whilst we see um, a concave positive relationship between low tech and, um, and um, um, CO2 emissions. And these results tend to hold across the, 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 sort of the, the, the various estimations we did, and as well as the, the various proxies of CO2 emissions that, that we used. And, and, and these results all sort of collaborate with, 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 the, with the argument that um, tech intensive industries tend to generate less CO2 emissions than low tech intensive industries, given that we, we do see here that low tech generates higher uh, CO2 emissions, whilst we do see in the linear term of minimum high tech value added share that um, 
um, these generate uh, lower CO2 emissions. So in, we, we considered as well um, the, the effect of export intensity on, on CO2 emissions. And uh, our data allowed us to... Five minutes. Very well. Our data allowed us to disaggregate um, between low-tech, medium-tech export and high-tech export. Um, what the results show is we do see a very positive relationship between low-tech export and, uh, and uh, CO2 emissions, while we do see a sort of a U-shaped relationship, which, which we, we refer to as a converse negative relationship between uh, medium-tech, both medium-tech um, and high-tech export. And um, one difference we also saw between the medium-tech export and high-tech export was that um, the, the, the effect of high-tech export is much more negative, indicating that the, the sort of the gradient of, 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 of the convex negative graph is much more um, um, slope, is much more negative in the high-tech with the medium-tech, indicating that the high intensity of export also uh, leads to higher, uh, sort of lower uh, CO2 emissions. So um, in, 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 con in conclusion, um, I would, I would say that over the last decade, uh, we've seen most developing countries uh, rearranging their structures of production and, and in the way and how they produce mainly goods and services, uh, much more towards tech-intensive industries. Um, but the, so some of the analysis we do see or, or the empirical literature looking at some of these issues are quite um, 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 little or scant. So we, we make some of these contributions, particularly in, in and our paper provides some of this evidence uh, quite clearly. Um, so highlighting some of the key policy implications that are coming up from our results, uh, I, I think we, we cannot enough sort of emphasize um, some of the pol key policy recommendations that are coming up. And we believe that one way developing countries can, can navigate the dual challenge that I've, I've emphasized a lot in the presentation is to sort of have deliberate policies uh, that shifts production processes to more tech-intensive in industries. Um, I think it is also very critical to mention that uh, we, are, we are not oblivious uh, to the fact that this is not a silver bullet, right? And we are not also in, under any illusion that industrial strategies targeting specific sectors, which I think we've been doing over the, over the last years, um, uh, which also specifically is part of most industrial policies, uh, will, will provide a straight jacket solution. Um, but we believe that there might be, for, for instance, a need to invest in human capital um, and, and productive capabilities in order to sort of try to avoid some, some things that we see emerging economies uh, facing or they losing the steam as, as they, try to, um, they try to develop. Um, yes, yeah, so, for, for future research, I think there are, there are a lot of specific things that can be done in terms of examining the, sec the specific sector uh, heterogeneities um, that could be possible, given that we do know that even for some high-tech sectors or high-tech industries, there may be differences in, in, in their CO2 emissions. Um, I, would, I would like to stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, what practical steps can we take to help manufacturers move more from being assemblers of machinery to uh, manufacturing? And um, I think, the f sorry for the video, we've got um, uh, internet connection has just gone down and so I'm tethering for my phone here. So I think industrial policy can move more manufacturers from just assembling of parts to manufacturing by supporting R&D. I think research and development is very important because the grain millers want machinery that meets their technological frontiers. And this is largely automated machinery. And so um, on that part, I think within the SADC region, we need to support definitely research and development into machinery that is meeting this technological frontier required by the users of it. And I think in terms of skills as well, we need to attract back our engineers to stay. I think I personally support reverse engineering as um, what was done in Asia. And so I think it's important for us as well to look at, um, for example, the Italian machinery that's coming into for 
may smelling and see how they're building it then reverse engineer as well. Uh, thank you. There, there's also a, a question from Lisa on the Q&A um, uh, where she um, says, great presentation, just wondering what's next. Is there further research plan beyond um, grain milling machinery to probably look at issues such as clothing, textile, um, and autos, whether you have um, looked at that as well? Uh, because it was a short research funded by SATR and the DTI, we would definitely look into looking into more machinery, as I noted the big list before. And so um, definitely it's something that we would like to look at and look at especially the main value chains that have been put in the SADC industrialization roadmap and start looking what's happening at the back end of these value chains in regards to the machinery happening there. So definitely it is research that we would like to take forward and look into, especially textiles as well. Thank you very much. Um, um, maybe quickly going to um, uh, Mr. Moyo. Um, I, I don't see a direct question for now and um, I'm sure colleagues are still uh, looking at that. But I, I wanted to check if, I, I, I see you have said somewhere that um, um, in terms of increasing the production to 125,000 tons in about uh, 2030, or let's say moving from 2025 to 2030, and then we included Namibia, is there, is there something that probably uh, stops um, that uh, or blocks that collaboration and now as opposed to um, having to wait for five years to see a, a bit of production given the proximity of uh, um, uh, Namibia and, uh, and, and, and Northern Cape, if we therefore have to look at this from a context of uh, regional cooperation. Uh, thanks, Tavano. Thank you for the, for the question. Okay, the growth in production uh, is mainly going to happen uh, in South Africa, specifically within the Orange River region. Okay. So it is an effort uh, that uh, was uh, initiated by the industry itself, you know, through their industry association raised in South Africa. And then uh, in collaboration with the IDC and the departments of agriculture, both uh, uh, national and, and, and provincially. Uh, in terms of collaborating with Namibia, you know, at the uh, primary production level, the there isn't much, as far as I know, uh, but it's something that maybe could be explored, you know, uh, as, as a way forward. And I think that is good food feedback that I'll, uh, I'll give to the industry, because this study, what we did, uh, we did a desktop analysis, uh, you know, and document analysis, and whatever we got as findings, we presented it to the industry for them to assist us in terms of suggesting market growth opportunities. So this point that you're raising uh, is quite uh, valid and it's quite important uh, in terms of collaborating with the Namibia at a primary production level. And it's something that uh, uh, I will uh, give as feedback to, to the industry for them to look at it uh, going forward. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Elvis, the, the, some questions on the q and I'm not sure if you are able to, uh, I'm able to see them. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've uh, seen them. So I, I do have two questions um, mm. directly. I think one from King and one from Frederick. And I would, I would want to respond to King um, one one first. Yes, um, I do agree that um, Green, green industrial policy or, 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 or green or capital intensive nationalization would be quite expensive um, for developing countries, particularly because we don't own some of these technologies and we don't produce some of these technologies. And to a large extent, people can also do argue that we don't have the capabilities to produce some of these technologies. Um, so, and also, some also argue that we don't have the, we don't have the skills to sort of co um, correctly appropriate some of these technologies, even if we have access to them, to our specific economic problems to resolve some of the issues that we face as, as a continent or as, 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 um, as people. So I, I agree uh, um, in that vein. But 
the reality of, of, of it is also that the climate problem tends to uh, ha have the biggest brand, at least for now, on, on developing countries. Because let's say sub Saharan African countries rely much more, are much more vulnerable, and we rely much more on, on, on climatic conditions for, for our, our, our agricultural production. So, what, what has been argued largely in the literature on, on green industrial policy is that there are enormous opportunities for developing countries, given that they have already low levels of, of, of capital intensity and low levels of industrialization. And also, they have, um, um, they have um, low levels of you know, prosperity that they, 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 all, they all aspire to. It, it presents us with, you know, already to just industrialize from this perspective because they have this, it gives us give this opportunity that, you know, um, we could, could already discuss. So I think that it's, it is, is the main form of the, the main frame of the issues that have been discussed, based on the fact that we, don't, we sort of, in, in a sense, have nothing to lose trying to go green in order to sort of uh, achieve our, our industrial objectives. Um, regarding Fredericks, um, yes, um, in, a, in our extended uh, results, we do see, as you rightly said, that non-renewable energy sources leads to higher uh, CO2 emissions, whilst renewable energy sources tend to um, uh, mitigate uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, but in terms of one sort of uh, one first step that other countries can take, I think that's a difficult. If you ask me, it's, it's quite a, a very difficult one. Um, what what our evidence support is that we should go tech intensive. But we also do know that we have issues with tech intensive. We also do know that we don't have the capability, some capability, we don't have the skills, we don't have the technologies. And also sometimes we don't have a uh, comparative advantage in the production of this, some of these tech intensive products. So um, what I would say, fr quite frankly, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a this is a very, represents one first step would be difficult other than to say that we need we need sort of a much more um, uh, policy mix, if 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 I would say, where we we we, we try tech intensive investment in nationalization, whilst investing also in in, in 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 education capabilities and skills, but also investing in in, in mitigating sort of sort of, our, sort of the trying to mitigate the, the sort of the, the climate problem. So I'll, I'll see it much more as, as, as a mix of policy reaction than just one of it. And I hope that that sort of responds uh, a bit to, to some of the two questions. Yeah, Th thanks Elvis. Probably just in 20 seconds, um, uh, before we can go to other questions and a special question from Matlore. There's a, there's a question from Rendani to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it on how do yeah, you differentiate between low, medium and high tech. Just 20 seconds, please, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Rodani. Um, so the differentiation. So in the data, we do we do have data on high tech. So we, we do this first of all. We do this differentiation for only exports because the, the data on manufacturing value added is only aggregated at medium and high tech manufacturing value added and and low and low, which you can already compute to low tech. But for added, ad, for exports, we do have data on medium and high tech exports. We have data on high tech exports. We have data on low tech export. So this we can already do that the the in simple arithmetic to get this uh, so this separate um, 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 tech intensive uh, export shares. So that that's simply what we did uh, yet. No, yeah, that, that's 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 fine. Um, uh, Kavanga the Matoria um, with regards to. Uh, how does one choose to produce dry grapes as opposed to um, um, uh, the wine? Um, is, is, is there a quality issue or, or why is it that we're exporting 90% um, of our production around this area? Uh, I'm not sure whether Mashori would you want to um, uh, say something before he answers? Okay. Uh, I would like to respond to this question by saying that uh, the vine fruit value chain uh, includes uh, wine, uh, juice, uh, 
table grapes and also dried grapes. So this is the, the, the value chain. It have got four uh, product streams. And then you find out the dried grape product stream is, is the smallest, you know, amongst the, 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 the three. And uh, the choice regarding uh, uh, dried grapes uh, relative to wine grapes, uh, you know, the way I understood uh, the wine fruit value chain is that uh, unlike other in other countries where dried grapes are actually a residual from wine grapes, you know, uh, it will be those grapes that don't meet quality standards to be uh, table grapes or to be used for wine. So they are being discarded into uh, dried grapes. But here in South Africa, uh, there are farmers who actually cultivate dried grapes, you know, grapes meant for, for, for drying, you know, not as a residual. So it's a deliberate move, you know, to actually go into dried grape farming, you know, farming grapes for drying. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, the choice also depends on uh, on profitability, you know, when you look at the export market, you know, uh, for a farmer to switch between wine grapes and uh, dried grapes, you know, they actually respond uh, to uh, market price movements globally. Okay, I hope I answered the question. Okay, no, you respond. There is a question that has been raised, Mr. Tsedu. Can I go ahead and respond to it? Uh, quick, quickly, my chief. Ten seconds, if you can. We just need to allow two people to make their comments. Okay. In terms of financing of the efforts, uh, from my side, the efforts uh, are going to be financed by the industry itself. You know, through their association, in terms of getting to market their products internationally, and in terms of uh, increasing production, uh, IDC is uh, part of the. Uh, initiative is a funding partner. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Let me say, yeah, there is a tax incentive that is led by uh, uh, Department of Science and uh, Innovation. Uh, in that area, uh, people are, they are participating willingly in that area based on their needs. But if we can use this platform for what we have actually identified now, okay? And then uh, I shall call for people to participate in this scheme. In that, in that case, I think I see us coming up probably, we can make an impact on uh, these regional value chains, chains where we can come up with a, a do R&D on the equipment that we need and secondly, on the make impact with regards to make do R and D on parts of, of these uh, imported uh, machines. So I was, I don't know if we can actually try to strengthen and uh, make a communi communication with uh, DSI and see if we can actually come in this area and say yes. Let us now start and identify this area and call for R and D to participate in this area. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, my leader. Um, I'm not sure whether there has been any updates on the on the on the scheme itself, but um, maybe if we can be able to share uh, any information with the team here, team, so that uh, that information could be circulated um, uh, to the colleagues and, and and be shared with the industry, so that they can take advantage of that. And that's it, Saidu. Uh, you have 30 seconds. Thanks, Vatemba. Um, yeah, I think it was just um, a general point to all three presentations. Kavanga tried to address it a bit more, but the question about then who finances all of this, I think in Gillian's case, why is an industry paying for the research and development if there's such a clear market opportunity? And uh, then what then is the real hamperment from the industrial policy side? And for Elvis as well, I guess, um, Yes, we all want this clean transition for manufacturing, but obviously um, 
people use low tech because that is where they are in the value chain. Moving to high tech um, is licenses and buying intellectual property from whoever owns the actual technologies and things like that. So who finances all of this? Thanks. Okay, yeah, if I may respond in 10 okay. seconds. I think, I, think, I think we need a big push, right? Um, all advanced countries and the emerging countries have had a big push in, in their industrialization drive. So developing countries or the you know catching up countries are in the big push from government. And this is not new. And we also do see now, as uh, so well in, in, in the COVID uh, scenario now that we are seeing big push from government to you know towards this you know um, finding of assets. So we our governments need to sort of kickstart and, and big push some of these initiatives, not just talk about it and leave it to the private sector. I think that is what we need. So we need a big push by the government government financing some of these you know, initiatives. It's also even being raised by colleagues to say, how do we therefore um, um, support this through financing mechanisms so that uh, something can be able to happen at industry level. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. And um, as part of our, our discussions uh, with TIPS is that some of uh, uh, this research work needs to find itself into um, some plans or policy recommendations that can then be able to continue to drive um, engagements at SADC level and continental level so that we can then be able to implement our strategies. Um, I think, uh, Baba, your final words uh, before we uh, we leave the session. Um, Thank you, everyone, for being patient with technological difficulties. Thank you to our presenters, our moderators for today. Um, our program still continues. We have another session on the 4th of August, starting at 10 a.m., followed by another session just as we did today. Um, so thank you to everyone uh, and uh, have a good day. Cheers.